top of my thankful list. I was I was considering this week how it was almost exactly a year ago that I was um, pastoring in a building that was literally falling apart at the seams and got a phone call telling me that the building had been sold and that we had no clue when we needed to get out of there. Um, and John and I sat down and, and had a conversation about how that might very well be the end of um, Harvard. And I said, well, I have a great idea. We're going to uh, find another church and then we'll just move our service to another time that they're not having service at the same time. And, um, and so we talked to the elders and said, what if we did a Saturday night service or a Sunday night service? And they said, no, 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 we should worship on Sunday morning. And I thought, this is impossible. Like, who's going to rent a worship space that we can do ministry out of for $1,200 a month? Because uh, that's not even, you can't even rent a theater for that. And um, over the next unfolding months, God gave Harbor a place. And um, this community keeps on going and um, in some ways it's getting more and more beautiful every day. So I'm thankful for you all because the church is not a building, but it sure is nice to have one when it's snowing outside. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm really thankful for it, but it's been a crazy year. We have John retiring, we have a new building, and now in just a few weeks we're going to be moving into another space and there's going to be a service right behind us, so we're going to have to move our fellowship time to somewhere else after the service. And um, It's a lot of change in a year and not a lot of information that has been given out. So, to help clear the air, keep the air clear, and um, to answer questions that you might have about what's gone on this year, as well as where we're going, as well as where we're at. Any questions or concerns you might have, I'm going to stick around after the service, um, right up here in the front, and if you want to get more information, or you want to hear other people's questions, or you want to ask me some questions, feel free. Let's, um, keeping the air clear is important. Otherwise, we have no clue what's going on, and then we make stuff up, and it's generally not helpful, and none of us make up the best case scenario. So, um, yeah, clear the air after service, if you would like. Um, feel free to be a part of that. So this week I was starting my work on continuing our series on freedom, and it was just not coming at all. I couldn't figure out any more scriptures that I wanted to work with, and it, nothing was coming through it. And then um, <coughs> I started looking elsewhere for inspiration, meaning I was scrolling through my Facebook feed. <laughs> and, um, and, and Alice was posting things like, I'm thankful for my neighborhood. And I was like, oh, good. I was just having a good day. It didn't even occur to me that it was November 1st um, that she did that. I'm having a good day. And then the next next day, she posts something up that says, I'm thankful for her fall leaves and for fall colors. I'm like, wow, two days in a row. That's pretty good. And then the third day, she says, I'm thankful for Harbor Church, a, a place where you can be yourself, love God, and love each other. It's not a great way of describing our church. Yeah. Um, I'm like, wow, three days in a row, that's starting to be a trend. And then it occurred to me, it's November 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. There might be something going on here. Um, and it really kicked into gear the fact that um, this is such an important month to be thankful. Um, and it's a really, really good practice in our lives. And so we're going to do a little short mini-series on thankfulness. And I want to start just by sharing um, the four F's that I always go back to during November for being thankful. Food, family, can't wait for that particular celebration. Um, it involves eating, so there's that. Um, friends, thank you all for being my friends. And, um, and football. I mean, <laughs> what, what better month could there be? I mean, we're right in the thick of amazing things. Um, and, and just in thinking of those four things, I feel happier, I feel lighter, like, all the stuff that's going on that's not very much fun. It doesn't overcloud everything. And um, so I was thinking, how cool would it be if over the period of this month we found ourselves not ignoring the stuff that's wrong in the world, not, uh, not having those struggles, but being able to be thankful in the midst of it, to take the load off and to appreciate what it is we've been given. Um, and I think it would open up our eyes just a little bit to pick up a little bit more of what God's doing. Um, when Christina and I go on road trips, um, she humors me by telling me that I'm the better driver and I need to drive through the mountains. 
I know for sure that Christine is a significantly better driver than me. So um, I finally figured out that she loves nature. Like she loves looking out at beautiful panoramas. And so she's always told me that she needs me to drive during those times so that she can be looking out the window um, and taking it all in. And um, it's not until we find like a pull off and I can get out and look around that I really appreciate where we've been. And driven that drive up to Whistler and it's absolutely gorgeous, but um, so often I'm worried about the snow and the curves that I don't take it in. And I think life is like that. We sometimes get caught up in what it is we're doing and needing to stay on track and, and get done what we need to get done that we can't stop long enough to be thankful for what it is that we have going on around us. So that's what we're going to try to do over the next month. And um, Jesus told a wonderful parable that gets right at the heart of Something that I think steals um, thankfulness from us. And you can find it in Matthew 20. And I'm going to read uh, verses 1 through 16. It's a wonderful little parable. also go work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever's right. And so they went. And he went out again at noon and at about three in the afternoon and did the same things. And at about five in the afternoon he went out and found still others standing around and he asked them, why have you been standing all day here doing nothing? Because no one's hired us, sir, they answered. And he said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came, and they each received their denarius. So when those who came who were hired first, they expected to receive much more. But each one of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last only worked one hour, they said, and, and you have paid them equally to us who have borne the burden of the work in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who, has, who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money, or are you envious because I am generous? And so the last will be first, and the first will be last. God, thank you that you are a generous God that you care for us, that you watch over us. Meet us where we're at. Meet us in the midst of what's going on in our lives. and Teach us how to be people who appreciate what you've given us. We love you. Amen. Amen. So this is describing a scene um, which would have been really, really common in Jesus' day. Um, and it's harvest time. And especially if you're dealing with grapes that that amount of time you have to collect all the grapes of the vineyard would have been a very short period of time. When the grapes are ready, they're ready. And one guy isn't going to be able to do it all. And so he goes and he finds a bunch of laborers waiting for work. Um, a scene you can find at Lowe's or Home Depot yeah. virtually most days. Um, and he starts to hire them. And, and what they're given is a denarius. It's, it's a day's wages. Uh, probably our equivalent would be like a $100 bill for a day's worth of work. Um, and these guys are sitting there hoping that they just get hired that day. Somebody pulls up and goes, hey, hop in the back of the truck. We're going to my vineyard. I'll pay you guys each a hundred bucks. And they are overjoyed. That was exactly what they were hoping for. In the morning, there's going to be food on the table tonight. Um, Jesus' culture was so poverty stricken. Roman taxing was incredibly high. Not a lot of ways to make income. And these guys have just been given an incredible gift of being able to work. Um, and then other guys were picked up. 
as the day goes on. And finally, uh, what's really crazy about the parable, 5 p.m. The closing day, at the end of the day, is 6. And these guys get picked up at 5 p.m. And the guy goes, I'll come to my vineyard and work. I'll pay you. And um, so, so they come. And then when they're about to get paid, I'm sure they're expecting very little. They only worked an hour. Maybe 10 bucks or something. And um, they're given a $100 bill. And friends, um, this in many ways, I think, is us, especially in the kingdom of God, that uh, whatever day our last day is, when we're standing before God and we are met with God's grace, when we're met with, hey, here's what you did, but here's what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you eternal life with me based on what Jesus has done. We're going to be shocked and surprised and go, yeah, but I didn't do very much. And what I did do, I sort of didn't do all that well. And God's going to say, can't I be generous with you? And we'll take it in. Um, but along with that, uh, the story continues with a bunch of people who get unhappy. And um, they're the guys who were working first, and they're about to get paid, and they're thinking, well, they made a $100 bill. I worked like eight hours. They worked one hour. That should be like 800 bucks. I didn't even know he was going to pay me $800. And, and he's... They're getting ready for this big pile of coins to be given to them, and, and he gives them one coin. And it's a very funny thing, because uh, they were so happy to get hired in the first place. They agreed on the wage, and it was a fair wage. So it's a really good situation as they're working those first hours of the day. What happened in between? Comparison snuck in. They started to compare themselves to other people. And suddenly what was so great was so not so great. Um, and it's a funny thing that we do. We really don't have like a measured playing field for trying to figure out what it is we've been given. So we do what our culture has taught us to do, which is to look around at other people and compare ourselves to them. And um, like part of Thanksgiving for me growing up was always a, a part of like our dinner was to consider those who were less fortunate than ourselves. And I think that's how it was always phrased, actually. It was that exact phrase. Before we eat, we should consider those who are less fortunate than ourselves. Um, I don't know what we were supposed to do with that consideration. Maybe it was just supposed to help us like realize how much we had. There wasn't anything that went with it, which was a little weird. Um, but by comparison, comparing ourselves to some folks who didn't have as much, we felt much better about what we had, I guess. And so we were thankful. Um, and then uh, as I got involved in, in being a Christian and got involved in Christian communities, one of the first things that uh, we did, we had this thing at our school called um, like a service night. And uh, we would go off and we would do some form of ministry. I was a Christian like five months when I went into Bible school. And so I'm like, oh, service night. I have no clue what this is. What are we going to do? And, um, and they just asked us all these different areas. You could help out with kids. You could help out with this. And I said, well, I want to help out with the homeless. That sounds fun. And um, our first night, we went in to um, help out with, like, uh, a shelter. And they were giving dinner to the homeless guys. And so we're behind the counter, and we're slopping food, me and my uh, fellow students. And we feel really good about ourselves because we've got to give some these people some dinner and um, and then we get done and we're like kind of slapping each other on the back going this was awesome we should do this every week and and then the guy who was instructing us said well now they got your food you should get your food and um, don't go sit with each other go sit at one of the tables talk to the guys and that was what we did um, for months actually we ended up sitting down with guys on corners and talking to them and and I wanted to do something for them. I said, can't I bring blankets or do something? And he said, I want you to sit and just talk with them. And something powerful began to happen because I got to know them. And what I found um, amongst the homeless community of Seattle was people who were smarter than me, people who were more capable than me, um, people who were definitely more interesting than me, for sure. Um, <laughs> And, and a whole slew of stories about what it was that got them off track. Uh, one guy I remember came down for a shipping job for, to build ships. And when he got here from Alaska after selling everything that he had to get this job, the job wasn't available anymore. Now what? Um, simple as that. Other, other folks um, 
worked with with street youth and um, would talk to them and go, man, why'd you run away? Why are you living on the streets? And they go, because I've been through like five foster homes and each one of them treated me worse than living on the streets with some friends. It all made sense um, to them. And it made me think about one of any number of a hundred things that could have happened to any one of us that we would have a very different life. The margin of error between us and anyone else is very small. And we have so much to be thankful for that we are here and in the position that we are. Um, I don't know why I was born in this country to this family that gave me tools to succeed and um, it doesn't make any sense to me, but it's just sheer grace. We're blessed. Um, At Thanksgiving, it's it's good for us to use some of what we have to help some other folks out. I love that we do the Thanksgiving dinners. Um, but I'm starting to really question the idea of we compare ourselves to those less fortunate than us to figure out how we're doing. Um, there's something broken in the midst of it. And um, part of the brokenness is if we buy into the comparison game, um, we don't only consider those who are less fortunate than ourselves. We consider other people around us too, don't we? Like we just kind of buy into that idea, and, and we go, yeah, but there's these other people, and and they're doing better than me. So what does that mean? Um, and it happens so quick, and and it happens really honestly in in some ways. Um, I got to tell you about going to pastor conferences. I almost hate to go to them now. I might write them off at some point altogether. But I go because I'm excited to like learn and grow, and I'm like. I have a great church, and I'm going to learn to be a better pastor. This is going to be the best day ever. And then I roll in, and the first conversation I have with somebody will go like this. Oh, so where do you serve? I'm like, oh, Harbor Church. This is a great little church in North Seattle. And they go, oh, I serve in Woodenville. How many people go to your church? I'm like, well, like 50. And they're like, oh, we baptized that many last Sunday. <laughs> then the presenter gets up, and he's like, oh, we baptized 10 times as much as that guy who you just talked to from Woodville. And then I end up leaving going, this is horrible. <laughs> is it me? Am I just a horrible leader? Like, all I figured out by coming here is how frustrated I am with my situation, because now I've compared myself to everybody else, especially people who are doing phenomenal things. Um, it's a lousy tool for figuring it out. Uh, you sit there and you look at your car and then your neighbor buys a new one and you go, hmm car stinks. Uh, if you're single, you look at couples and you go, Valentine's Day is the worst. They're so happy together. But if you're like a couple and you see a single person, you're like, man, they're free to do whatever they want. <laughs> and if you have kids, you look at couples going and taking vacations and you're like, that would be awesome. We can only get to go to Disneyland and that costs us a small fortune to do it. But if you don't have kids, you're like, who am I leaving my life to? What is my legacy? I don't know. Um, we always have a tendency to look over the fence and think that the grass is greener in some ways. Um, this week was the trade deadline for the NFL. And inevitably, there will be someone, I'm still waiting for him to pop up, who will go, my contract's only six million. I mean, uh, the guy down the street's making 10 and he's not even as good as I am. What's the deal? Um, I think they've learned to like try to not do that because it makes all of us mad. Because we're like, dude, I work really, really hard and I'm not even getting a million, so I don't know what you're going to <laughs> But we're unhappy then because we're comparing ourselves to a guy who plays football. Why are we unhappy? No. The last of the Ten Commandments is this. Don't cover your neighbor's house, wife, servants, animals, or anything else belonging to them. Why would God make that the last commandment? Um, I think it's because he knows that we want to do that. And if we do that, it's going to stop us from appreciating what we've been given. Um, so how do we get back to a place of thankfulness? How do we do what this parable taught us of, of verses 13 through 15 where it says, take your denarius and go. Like, be thankful for what you have. Recognize the gifts that you've been given. And, and don't be irritated at God's generosity towards somebody else. Um, I think there's a couple things we can do. 
Um, the first thing is to just stop comparing. And to show you how ridiculous this comparing thing can be, um, this week I heard Adele turn down a private gig um, to play a concert for an Arab billionaire who was willing to pay her $1.3 million to do a private show for one night. She turned it down to do some gardening, <laughs> which makes no sense to me whatsoever, but she does make $59,000 per day. So maybe you can turn down the 1.3 mil. Um, but she probably feels really poor comparing herself to Bill Gates who made $9.3 million per day last year. But here's a quote from Bill Gates about what his money means to him. It's, it was absolutely fascinating to me. This is um, from Forbes. and it, um, He said, money has no utility to me beyond a certain point. Its utility is entirely in building an organization which is dedicated to getting resources out to the poorest in the world. What a cool thing. I want to be like that guy who goes, whatever I have, I have so that I can serve others with it. That's a good spot for thankfulness. Whatever we have, we've been given, so we can be of service to somebody else. Because there's always going to be somebody with more, and there's always going to be somebody with less. So maybe the better question is this. What have I been given? Is it enough? And can I bless somebody else with it? That sounds like a pretty darn good life. Um, The guys in the parable had a problem only when they looked over at each other. And if they had just said, look, God's given me enough for the day. He's watched over me thus far. He probably will continue to do so. Uh, let's start there. Matthew 10, 29 through 31. I want to read it. Uh, it's one of those nice pithy sayings that I often glance over. Um, I really have got to learn to use bookmarks. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and yet not one of them fall to the ground outside of your father's care? And, and even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You're worth much more than sparrows. God cares for us. Um, he watches over us. And if it were not for Jesus sustaining all things, James tells us every good and perfect gift comes from above. If it weren't for God giving us much, um, we would not be here right now. We would not be alive. So the comparison game, it's not going to help us. Let's let God be the center. Um, and then Romans 12 has been coming up a ton in my life lately. Right? It's a fantastic passage. And um, it says this, Rejoice with those who are rejoicing. Mourn with those who are mourning. What if instead of it being about us and what we have, what if instead when we saw somebody doing well, we thought, wow, that's awesome. I'm going to rejoice with them. And when somebody was doing less well with us, we mourned with them. We stepped into the deficit with them and figured out what we could do to be a part of it. So, first suggestion, comparison game. It's not how it's built. It doesn't serve us very well, so let's quit it. Second one is this. Um, pray for other people, especially those that you find yourself wishing you were. It's a very funny thing. It's really hard to resent people while you pray for them. <laughs> like it, it's really, really hard to do it. It's like God uses prayer to just kind of tune our hearts just like a guitar string into his will, which is to rejoice with others who are rejoicing and to mourn with those who are mourning. Um, it's a story that I read this week that really touched me as I was thinking about the whole pastor conference thing. And in England, late 1800s, there were three great preachers in the exact same neighborhood at the exact same time at three prominent churches. Um, Charles Spurgeon, whose sermons are still considered today, uh, he was there He's the Prince of Preachers and G. Campbell Morgan and F. B. Myers. And they're all famous preachers whose sermons are read today. They happen to be in the same town at the same time doing ministry. And F. B. Myers in particular had the smallest church, and he was really, really mad about it. Mm -hmm. Like, 
kind of stinks to be like the third most gifted person. Um, and these other two churches are thriving. And so he went to the Lord and goes, Lord, what do I do with this? I don't want to envy them anymore. Um, but I can't stop myself. And, and the Lord said, well, pray for them. That was not the answer that he wanted to hear. Um, but he decided to do it. He said, pray for them to thrive and to grow. So he started praying for them, and their churches continued to grow. Um, but something happened. He began to be happy to see people going to their churches. And then the other thing that happened was their churches got so packed that they couldn't handle any more room. And so everybody who was frustrated by the crowds found their way into his church. Um, and it reminds me of something that Martin Luther King Jr. always talked about, which is that we are way more connected to each other than we think we are. When somebody else is thriving, eventually we will thrive too. And when somebody else is put down, it hurts all of us. Um, that's what the Bible is teaching here in this idea of rejoice with those who are rejoicing and mourn with those who are mourning because we're all connected in God's family. Um, Lou Gehrig, uh, known for Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, but he was a famous baseball player, Yankee. And um, in a couple days before he died, he called his friend Bob and he said, uh, I got good news. Uh, they came up with a new serum and it's, it's helping nine out of 10 people with this disease. And um, his buddy asked him, How is, is, is it responding for you? Is it helping you out? And he goes, well, no. Not at all, but 9 out of 10. That's pretty great. <laughs> what a cool attitude. What a cool attitude to be like, I'm, I'm just happy to see people blessed. Um, he had a life where he had stopped caring about himself and was able to care about others and, and saw their success as a beautiful thing. Um, maybe that's what we could be. We'd be people who it's not even about us anymore. It's about seeing what God can do in people's lives. So, stop comparing, pray for others, and then lastly, just be thankful for what we have. Um, it's enough. Until we actually um, call out our blessings, there's something really powerful about what Alice is doing. And I like to think of thankfulness in sort of a vague, broad term, being thankful. But it isn't until we start to put it into paper or to tell somebody or to to write it down, things that we're thankful for, that we don't, that we, that we start to realize how much we actually have. And within that, there's this, this beautiful secret, and it's, the secret is we've been given a lot and more than enough. Paul, Philippians 4, um, he says, I'm not saying this because I am in need. I've learned to be content whatever my circumstances. I always thought that'd be cool to be content whatever my circumstances may be. Um, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned a secret to being content in any and every situation, whether I'm well-fed or hungry, or whether I'm living in plenty, or whether I'm living in want. It's this, that I can do all things through him who gives me strength. In other words, what God has given us is enough. It doesn't mean that things are rosy-colored. I hate that image of Christians being like super happy and, oh, my life is awesome, I'm so blessed, when they don't feel blessed. It doesn't mean that there's no gaps. It doesn't mean that the stuff isn't hard. It just means that I recognize that what God has given me is enough. And it's pretty good. Lou Gehrig uh, had to quit baseball two years before his death. Um, he had to retire and he stood before a packed Yankee Stadium. He had to quit Earlier than he should have, he was setting great records. I mean, he was a phenomenal baseball player. And, uh, and here he is in the midst of losing his career, losing the game that he loves, losing his legacy. And you know what he said on that night as he said goodbye to baseball? I'm the luckiest man in the world. And that's actually the title of his biography. Um, I'm the luckiest man in the world. A guy who had a deadly disease named after him because he had to stop his career early because of the disease and it was terminal and was gonna take his life in just two years, says, I'm the luckiest man in the world with what I've been given. Wow. That's who I want to be. Um, he figured out the secret. Been given a lot. We have a lot to be thankful for.